We all go six feet deep in the ground. I think now they're digging them about four and a half feet to save money. But we all end up in a casket. And people wipe their eyes. Because we're gone. It's called fact. If you saw where I grew up, the time period would have been in the 1950s. But if you saw it, you would have thought it was 1850. Log house, milk cow, plow horse, no bathtub, no commode. Like Coca-Cola's little, none, none of that, no. I never heard anyone say we were poor, not once. No one ever said, man, we are really up against it here. I wonder why somebody doesn't bail us out. <laughs> no. I ran up on Miss Kay when she was 14. There's an old saying in the South, if you marry them when they're about 15 or 16, they'll pick your ducks. If you wait till they get to be 20, they'll pick your pocket. So Miss Kay and I married early. Bill started school and we were so poor. So in love, but so poor. Baby on the way. Actually, Alan was born, I was 17 years old, and Phil was 18 years old. So we were basically two kids with a kid. But you have to grow up and you do. That's what you do. Now when I got to college, I was on my way to being a bone to be chewed, as they say. I started seeing the change in Phil, and this really came when he started spending a lot of time with the football team. Parties in college, you know. It was the 60s. Y'all remember the 60s, don't you? What I saw was Phil, who had never drank before, started drinking. And what happened with me was it was scary to me. Jason was born, so thrilled about another boy. Phil was happier than ever. Unfortunately, the drinking got worse. He would be mad and just be in and out like a flash. And I knew then, but I didn't want to believe it, was running around on me. Probably smoking dope, other things, pills he took, things like that. It was just all new to me, the whole thing. I owned a beer joint when some guy came in with a Bible and he wanted to introduce me to Jesus. I ran him away. I said, get out of here. I'd take another drink. Then we have our new baby. Willie Jess. So there I was, a barmaid who doesn't drink and had three little boys. I've been fighting for this marriage for a long time and it's not working. But what went on next was horrible. It was like the nightmare of my life. I got in a big bar room brawl. The laws got after me. I went to the woods, of course, and um, he had out. Phil came to me and said, I probably won't surface for two or three months. Do the best you can with what's left here. And he was gone. He became more and more mean and mean-spirited. And what I would tell my boys all the time is, that's not your daddy. That's the devil in your daddy. 
I would say the low point is when I ran Miss Kay and the kids off. You're all alone, no hope, miserable. That's when I began to serious contemplate, is there a way out of all this? So I came to Miss Kay and she said, you know the guy that came up there to the beer joint at that time and wanted to talk with you? I said, yep. And you ran him off? I said, yeah. Why don't you sit down with him and, and just see what he has to say? So I sat down with this guy. He said, Phil, what do you think the gospel is? And I said, I don't know, gospel music on the radio or something like that. He said, you don't even know what it is. I said, I don't guess I do. I didn't even know what the gospel of Jesus was. So when he went through Jesus coming down in flesh through a little virgin girl, Mary, dying on a cross, being buried and raised from the dead, I'm like, how in the world did I ever miss that? I had missed it. I was blown away when I heard that Jesus died for me, was buried and raised from the dead. Something so, it is simple but profound that happened back there almost 2,000 years ago. I had never heard it. When we came back home, I think there was a note that said they had gone to the church building. So we headed in there, and when we got into the auditorium, I just stopped because there he was up in the baptistry with a man. And the boys all stopped, and they were on each side of me. And <clears throat> I remember just looking at them, and he was, I heard Phil say, I want to make Jesus the Lord of my life. I want to follow him from this day forward. And I looked down at each one of the boys. Tears were rolling down their eyes. Even three-year-old, three-and-a-half-year-old Willie Jess, big tears were coming down. And the next thing I knew, he was baptized. And I come up, and the boys started hollering and singing, jumping all over the place. And they said, my daddy, my daddy saved, my daddy saved, my daddy saved. They were so happy. And it was the, it was the complete family then. I said, I'm fixing to hang another gear, and I'm turning from my sinful past, and I am fixing to make a valiant attempt to be good. I said, I've never tried it before. I told the guy when he studied with me, he said, just love God and love your neighbor. And try to be good. I'm like, I've never tried that before. He said, can you try? I said, I can try. See, you got rednecks, then you have river rats. So I'm reading over in Romans chapter 12, be good to your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Do not return evil for evil. The river rats tend to be far better thieves than your just local rednecks. You be good to them and don't return evil for evil. I was fishing for a living. It's my livelihood. I'm working my tail off. They're hungry, feed them. These river rats would, would steal my fish. I'd caught several of them before then. Usually I'd just come up, roar out there, come up with my shotgun and say, the next person who moves dies. They're stealing my fish here, Lord. They're hungry feed them. And you want me to do what? Do not return evil for evil. Well, I have to see if that will work, but it makes no earthly sense, that's for sure. So one day I heard a motor slow down. These guys pull over to my, to my float and I'm watching them through the bushes. So I said, I'm gonna be good to them, but I'm carrying my gun just in case. They're not good to me. And I'm gonna do what the Lord said. I'm gonna be good to them. So I roar up on them, and they're getting my net almost up in their boat, and they look up, and they see this guy coming. They beat me wide open. I said, 
what were you boys doing with that net? And they said, oh, is that what that was? I said, yeah, that'd be a hook net. It belongs to me. I said, here's the good news. I'm going to raise the net, and whatever's in there, I'm going to give them to you. And when I said that, they looked at each other, and they said, they left me looking back. And all of a sudden, up and down the river, they quit stealing my fish. I just gave them what they were trying to steal. I took that to mean God was right all along. The first year in sales, I had turned to God. First year sales, duck commander, 8,000 bucks. I said, Miss Kay, we are rolling. She said, we are gonna starve to death. I said, no, nah, we're not gonna starve. We'll be all right. <laughs> this is Alan, Jason, Willie, and Jeff. They all run the company and their wives. So one of them told me the other day, he said, Dad, you remember when you started out with that $8,000 worth of duck calls? I said, yep. They said, this year we're gonna sell close to a million duck calls. It was either dog luck, but I am giving the credit to God Almighty in heaven for the duck call sales, the fish that were in the nets way back for my life. I'm giving the credit to the Almighty, and we shall see at the end how it turns out. I feel pretty good about it. You gotta have air pressure. You get a lot of pressure behind your tongue. Like a kazoo? Like a kazoo? Uh, not so much kazoo. <laughs> you ready? Yeah. Yeah. Dad always told us, uh, you know, a man should be able to provide for his family. And that includes food and everything else because uh, he always told us at one point there was no such thing as a grocery store. Totally got picked on a ton by my brothers. You know, we'd go out, we all played basketball, which is funny because my dad played football. And uh, so we'd be out, we'd play horse or something. And if I won, they would, you know, give me a swirly or give me one of those armpit, sweaty armpit, uh, I don't know how you say that. <laughs> My dad actually, um, as he was getting the duck call business started, he uh, was a commercial fisherman. So, wasn't a lot of money, uh, but we ate real good. I would go out as a kid and, and run the motor for my dad and um, as he picked up these big hoop nets and uh, I would ride with my mom to the fish market and uh, sell fish and that's kind of how we made a living. Here's the thing, my, my parents took in so many like transient people they'd see on the side of the road. They're like, y'all want something to eat? They're like, yeah, we're hungry. They'd pick them up, bring them down the river, feed them, let them stay a couple days, give them a little money. The thing was, my parents didn't have a lot of money at the time, but my dad just wanted to, to share Jesus with people and, um, you know, get them to heaven. So we didn't matter what color your skin was, how bad your past is, uh, they were just gonna help people out. Later in life, uh, when I got up to about 18, I met a couple guys when I was right toward the end of my senior year. And, uh, you know, they were doing stuff a little bit different. And I just thought, you know, maybe I should just, you know, hang out with these guys some and just kind of experience what the world has to offer. And uh, it got pretty ugly there. Uh, lots of drug use, alcohol. I pretty much did anything that was put in front of me. I remember smoking a joint that was dipped in formaldehyde. They called it a wet daddy. 
taking pills. To be honest with you, I don't know what all pills I took. I remember waking up, I had one leg in my truck door and it was on a gravel road and I was all skin up my arms um, and I drove somewhere that night and to this day I don't know what I did that night and uh, I hope I didn't run over somebody, I, I don't know. I knew at that point I was, I was really off the tracks. But the funny thing is, I didn't stop. I got up the next day. Where's the drugs? Where's the alcohol? Let's just keep going. I was hiding that from my parents, and it was just the battle of trying to, was just nothing to look forward to. So empty, no decency whatsoever. One night, got drunk and went to the movies. And uh, my brother, Willie, uh, left a note in my truck. And he said, I know what you've been up to. We need to talk. I show up down at Dad's house at 8 in the morning. All my brother's trucks are there. Uh, and I'm thinking, what are they all doing here? And uh, I go in the house, and they're just all sitting around the couch looking at me. It was Jason, Alan, Phil, and Willie were in the living room. I couldn't even get in the living room. I couldn't make myself even go in there. My heart just starts beating out of my chest. And my dad said, son, are you ready to change? He said, I just want you to know that we've come to a decision as a family, and it's gonna be either you are gonna join us Fallen God, are you gonna go on your own and you can just, you know, good luck to you in this world, but you'll just be on your own. So that's your two choices. I just fell down on my knees and started crying. I said, what took y'all so long? And he said, Dad, I don't deserve to come back. I've been horrible. Let me tell you some more. And Phil said, no, son, you've told me enough. You know, I've seen my dad cry maybe three times, and that was one of them. And uh, to see my dad that upset, and it was tears of joy. I want you to know that God loves you and we love you, but you just can't live like that. And he said, I know. I want to come back home. My brothers, they were all crying, and we, at one point, we just got in the middle of the room and just got, all got down on our knees and just cried and just prayed to God, just thank you for getting me out of this, because I'm done living the way I've been living. I remember Dad saying, my prodigal son has returned, and, and uh, it was just one of the best days of my life. And uh, so he said, I'm going to put you on house arrest. You cannot leave this house for three months, and you got to duck hunt every single day. I said, all right, Dad, I think I can do that. Yeah, I'm smiling on my push because you can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> you have a great whisker smile. I always tell them, look, look a little rough around the edges, but I always remember this. The man appointed by God to pave the way for the Savior of the world. John the who? They all said, John the Baptist. I said, he looked rougher than I do. <laughs> Trust me. A couple of years ago, I was, um, it started, I just started to get like real cynical and like looking at everything as in like, as in like that's wrong, like they're looking at that wrong because I thought I had it all figured out. I guess I just got really caught up in thinking that I was better than everyone else because of who my family was. Like look who I, look who I have to, 
you know, give me the answers and, and all that. I mean, really, 12 million people watch us every year. I mean, every week, actually. I guess that's, that's part of the pressure that's, that's on me. And I started getting really cynical and like looking down at other people. And before I knew it, no one, no one was there, <laughs> nobody. It eventually led to uh, like thoughts of suicide, stuff like that. <laughs> it's gonna seem kind of stupid, but everybody was having this huge party and watching movies, you know, and stuff like that after church. And I knew that they were going. And so I went to church and I, I, some, I halfway hoped that they were gonna invite me to do that, you know, cause I just wanted to so bad. I'd finally hit rock bottom and I wanted to be a part of it again. But they weren't gonna, you know, invite me to anything like that. It was pretty hard <laughs> because I went home and my brother left the house to go to the party and I was just sitting there and I was like, wow. Like, it, it just seemed so small, but to me, like, that was just really big. Like, that no one wanted anything to do with, with a cynical person like me. I think, to me, that's just what sticks out of my mind is, I was like, what am I doing? Like, like, why would I act like that? And, and I went on to just like keep on doing it. You know, it just made me more mad and more mad. I told my youth minister that I was, I pretty much told him that I wanted to kill myself. Uh, I'd finally hit rock bottom and I wrote a letter and I was gonna do it. I really was. And so then my parents found out about it. <sighs> And uh, my mom was devastated. Of course, she's crying and all this kind of stuff. She's thinking where she went wrong and when it wasn't her at all. And uh, I think that right after that, that night, that sit down with my dad, it really, that's what turned it around because my dad told me, he said, that is the most selfish thing that you can do I'm sorry. Take your time, man. <sighs> but he told me, he said, that's the most selfish thing that you can do is is leave this world because you can't take it. And uh, I, th I really believe that that's true. And um, I mean, I just thought about like, I'm about to leave all these people that I could have a really huge impact with because I can't take it because I feel bad and because I have a cynical attitude. And that was just, I mean, that really just hit me hard and that's what turned me around. That statement right there is what turned me around. It was a relief whenever I came out of that. I think that just knowing that that I was back on track with Jesus and knowing that I I was he was okay with with um with me coming back to him and it doesn't matter what I did, it doesn't matter what I've been through, it doesn't matter what I'm going to do, and he's gonna be there and he's gonna love me just the same because he died for me. I was finally free of of doubts, of having an attitude of being cynical. You know, I remember being so relieved. And Jesus brings that relief. I think that that's who taught me that, is my, um, the men in my life and my family. <sighs> what about the beard? You got a beard in your future? I think I might grow one out, you know, just to say I did it. <laughs> But uh, right now, I can't. We can't grow beards at school because it's against the rules. But um, my dad, my dad's always said, he said, if you ever get in trouble with a beard up at school, I'm coming straight up there. <laughs> We're just some good old country folks from Louisiana, and it's just weird to have people stop you at the grocery store and want to take a picture. But you know. 
the way I look at it, you know, God had a plan for us to to do what we do, to say what we say, so um, other people can come to know Jesus. When the when the show first started, they said we want a lot of fighting and we want y'all to get mad at each other and like bickering and and try to get us to cuss and do all that kind of stuff. And I mean, our family was like, that's that's not who we are. Everywhere I go, everything I do, this is what I talk about. They'll tell me to give a speech on something else, but guess what? It always comes back to this. We all go six feet deep in the ground. The grave is a problem, so is sin. Jesus came down in flesh and saw both of them. So for me, my household, I just think that uh, we would all be better off if we loved God and loved each other. At the end of the day, you will be happy, happy, happy. My name is Phil Robertson. My name is Miss Kay. My name is Jeff Robertson. My name is Reed Robertson and I'm second. See, in the South, we don't say second. We say second, like it's a T on it, second. You know what I'm saying?